Hello and welcome to the National Conference on Behavioral Insights 2021. My name is Izaha and I am the moderator for this session. I am pleased to moderate this session titled You Better Behave, I Have Your Data, Data Compliance Obligations, Behavioral Insights and Analytics. Thank you, MPC, for this opportunity. Our speaker for today will be Nadarajna Raj Saguna Raj, or better known as Raj. Welcome, Raj. A bit of background about Raj. Raj is the head of technology practice, which includes advising on personal data protection, communications, and multimedia and competition law. He has advised and assisted various clients across multiple industries in implementing personal data protection compliance awareness programs, including data sets advising on mandatory requirements for privacy notices, cross-border personal data, consent requirements, and minimum data security requirements. He has also in-house corporate working experience for GLC in the automotive sector, where he was responsible for, among other, the company's competition and personal data compliance programs. That's a bit about Raj. If you have any questions for Raj during this presentation, please feel free to leave them in the chat box below, and we will address them at the end of the session. If there's a lot, you can't get through all the questions during the session, Raj has assured me he will address the questions through email personally. Now, before I queue in Raj for the session, let me set the stage on the topic for today. This concept of behavioral insights or what is commonly called nudging is a brilliant idea because it uses understanding of people's behavior to influence outcomes. Using this scientific approach, we need to record data of a person's preferences, tendencies, patterns, and so on before we can actually begin to understand what the best nudge actually is. And with technology and how machine learning is becoming more and more sophisticated, we can actually input large amounts of data that will develop algorithms of more complex and accurate nudges automatically. But at the heart of this process is something crucial that we cannot forget, which is data. And before we go on and talk about how to use data, we need to remember that data is subject to legal rules on consent and privacy, which protects individuals. So Raj, let me leave this parting question to you and the audience to think about, which is, would you agree to disclose your personal data to someone knowing that someday they might use that data against you to influence your behavior? Over to you, Raj. Hey, Zaha, thank you so much. Uh, to answer your question, just don't disclose it to my wife or she'll use it for the wrong reasons. Okay, <laughs> I would... Let me jump straight. Thank you so much for this opportunity, MPC, and, and, and everybody that's listening in. Um, I wanted to, to just touch base on the broader picture in terms of a compliance. Um, oil used to be the most valuable commodity, but everybody now knows that actually data has overtaken uh, oil and gas. I mean, look at the biggest tech companies, you know, they are, their valuations is, is sky high, right? And, and why? It's because of the data that they, they have and how they can use the data um, to advance business and also right to this topic, behavioral insights. Now, behavioral insights and big data, it's, it goes hand in hand. Um, with all the benefits that you get from behavioral insights, what fuels behavioral insights is actually data. Now, I've come across this World Bank blog on leveraging behavioral insights in the age of big data. And they gave us three examples in terms of how they can use data um, for behavioral insights. So first is data and behavioral traits, right? Um, it is possible to extract patterns from data sets to study the determinants of a given behavior. This approach has the advantage of using various data points around the world and trying to find out what is the behavioral trait as opposed to using only a few observations in a lab experiment. So the, if the, the benefits are wider when you use data sets. Data and behavioral science. Now, data and behavioral science can be combined to predict certain purposes. Um, there's a lot of research in genome economics where genetic data is used to predict outcomes such as risk aversion, financial decision-making, educational atten attainment, this one's controversial, political preferences, who you're gonna vote for the next GE. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and also the well-being of, of, of uh, subjective well-being. Um, the other one is data and policy impact. So a lot of times, and, and this I think directly um, relates to what MPC is doing uh, in terms of the impact of a certain policy. By using data, you'll be able to measure whether the particular policy is effective, not effective, the changes that needs to be made. So data gives that all these benefits when it comes to behavioral insights. 
Um, now, very commonly, and this is actually a, a slide that I think is useful to go into what we're going to talk about um, in, in, the, in the session, is what are the data collection tools? Because for in order to fuel your behavioral insights, you need modern technology to collect data. And we, we know these bubbles, right? We, we see this in all the privacy notices. When you log on to any social media platform, any digital platform, e-commerce platform, you will see these things uh, informing you that, we are, that the business or the company is using these methods to collect your data. Cookies, very common, right? It's, 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 it, a lot of companies use cookies to, uh, to help them uh, navigate through um, the product services of the company, web beacons, data analytics tools, and website analysis. With these tools, businesses are able to enhance um, the reach to consumers um, by gathering the data. Okay, Raj, yeah. there's a uh, lot of types of data there. So uh, are you telling me that uh, all, not all data is regulated? So data comes in various shapes and forms and not all data is free. In fact, a lot of data is regulated. So what I've done here is to actually categorize the types of data. You have one category of regulated data. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by this in the next few slides. And then you have corporate data and personal data. This is very important because if it's corporate data, a different set of rules would apply. If it's personal data, a different set of rules would apply. Anonymized and aggregated data. Generally, when you talk about behavioral insights, it, you, you may need very personalized data, but more often than not, you need an aggregated or form of data in order to analyze patterns. Now, when you have anonymized data as opposed to say uh, specific data, different rules would apply. And when you collect these data, you have to comply with different set of uh, compliance obligations. Then the other bucket is commercially sensitive data and also confidential information. Um, certain commercially sensitive information is very valuable when it comes to uh, behavioral insights. You want to understand, for example, the, the pattern that a consumer uses to make payments, his payment preferences, which kind of e-wallet he likes to use, why, because perhaps the acceptance rate in the store that he likes to go to is better. So these behavioral insights um, would rely a lot on this commercially sensitive data, but collecting it and using it have got its own set of rules. So when you embark on a project on uh, say, for example, to do behavioral insights, what you need to do is to identify the type of data that you need. And from there, go uh, drop down window to see what are the rules that would apply to the data that you are going to collect and use? Now, let me go into a bit more detail. Regulated data. There are laws that, there are certain laws that govern um, the data that you process. For example, and very popularly, the Financial Services Act. This is regulated by the central bank and it applies to financial institutions. Um, they, uh, it applies to the insurance companies. It also applies to even your um, payment systems uh, operators, you know, those e-money, e-wallet players. Now, when you gather data um, on payment, uh, a person's banking account or his, his activities in his accounts, those data is regulated and you must ensure that you have consent of the individual to get the data. If you do not and you process it without consent, it's a criminal offense. Next is personal, the Personal Data Protection Act. Remember the earlier slide I was saying that you need to categorize data, whether it's personal data or corporate data. Why? Because of the PDPA. Now, the PDPA regulates any data that relates to an individual. So let's say, for example, your behavioral insight, you're studying about, um, say, men, age, this and above, and what's their preferences in terms of which barber they go to. Maybe ah, it's not a good I wouldn't be a good subject for that. But <laughs> no, <laughs> anyway, <we're> <laughs> so, but you, you, you need to really identify the individuals in the study or you just need the pattern. Because the difference is if you were going to say that Raj and Izaha goes to this barber, why? Because of this reason, the data, Personal Data Protection Act would apply. Then you need to check whether you need to get my consent or and you need to get Izaha's consent. 
If you don't, if you say men above the age of 40 like to go to this barber because of what reason? It doesn't identify any person. You don't need to comply with the personal data protection. Why? Right. It's not personal data. It's aggregated. So it makes a big difference when, when the planning uh, in terms of the data that you collect uh, for behavioral insights, uh, it's very important so that you identify the rules that you need. Now, of course, the last bucket there is the official secrecy. That's a bit drastic. I, I, I do understand, but I thought for completeness, I should mention it. Why? Because some certain type of government-related or public agency data can be classified data. Um, this, is, this is confidential. It's state secret, which means that you can't use it. Yeah, it has to be declassified before it can be used. Now, this is very important because, say, for example, um, matters pertaining to government finance, uh, national registration, uh, national security issues, um, these are all class can be classified under the official secrets. Now, the other thing is non-law um, regulations, which is contractual. Say, for example, you enter into a business-to-business con -business contract where the data is protected by confidentiality. Say, you need to get the other party to agree before you can disclose the data for studies. You can't just use it because that could be a breach of contract. So it becomes important because, say, for example, certain hospitals um, may, may have a contract with their IT service provider to process patient data. The IT service provider cannot just disclose the data to any third party because they are contractually bound with the hospital to maintain um, the data on their behalf. So these are some of the restrictions on the use of data. Okay, I, I've generally explained uh, this in my earlier slide. Um, this is just a bit more elaboration on um, what each law entails uh, for, on the processing of data. Um, so for the Financial Services Act, generally you require consent. Same with the Personal Data Protection Act. The Private Healthcare Facilities and Services Act applies to your hospitals, uh, private hospitals. So if you go to, to any one of those private hospitals for treatment, um, any, any condition, um, that data that the hospital has cannot be disclosed to say a pharmacist so that the pharmacist can come and say, hey, Raj, you went to the hospital for this treatment last week. Huh? Can I prescribe some medicines for you from this particular brand? It's very effective. They can't do that unless I consent. So that, doesn't, that, that medical data is not only governed under the Personal Data Protection Act, but it also, it's also governed under the Private Healthcare Facilities and Services Act. Same again, it generally requires consent. So it, you can see the pattern here where I'm getting at. Consent is something that's very important when you are collating and collecting data. Right. And I guess that means that if we, uh, you know, you really just pick the terms and conditions without actually reading it, then we're liable, right? Even though we don't actually read and, and give full consent to these people to do whatever they want with that information. Exactly. So always read the tips or, or always hire lawyers like Izaha and me to read it for you. <laughs> but it's important. Why? Because look, a lot of how come, and, and this is business. So, so, so when you are, when you're offered a product, you, certain companies will say, look, we're offering you this package. We are actually giving you something. Uh, we're giving an upgrade on a hotel, say, for example, right? But you need to sign on our privacy notice. And the privacy notice says we can use your data, you know, um, your preference, your, your, your bonus points and all these things uh, for, to better our services. You, you would just sign off on the privacy notice without even looking at it, right? But th that, that is consent and, and that, that is kosher, that's proper. Um, the, the, the problem is if you, if you carry out a study, not knowing that you actually have to get consent from some of your subjects, you collect all that data, massive amount of data in your system. And later on, you listen to Raj's and Izaha's webinar here and you realize, oh, I haven't gotten consent. I can't use that data. I can't use it for the study. Then it's a big waste. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of resources. So you need to get it right at the onset so that your study or your, 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 your behavioral insights project is not jeopardized because you didn't comply with it. Okay, I, I won't dwell too much into this, but I think behavioral insights um, relies also a lot and involves a lot of public authorities and also the government sector. Um, that is very, so the Official Secrets Act has become very important because the Official Secrets Act is worded very widely in terms of what can be an official secret. So from government federal level to state level, uh, 
the government can classify information to be uh, official secret. So if you are in the public sector, if you are looking at certain type of data, always check whether it is classified. If it is, you definitely need to go back to the government agencies uh, to discuss in terms of how you can or cannot use the data because the penalties when it comes to the official secret sector is very severe. Yeah, I was going to ask you uh, on this slide, you put this uh, ATI law. So is this uh, something similar to freedom of information laws? That's correct. So in many jurisdictions, to avoid, to, to allow more transparency and open government, um, they have this Freedom of Information Act where members of the public uh, business sectors are able to access certain amount of public, public sector data for businesses, for policy considerations, and um, also for general uh, freedom, of, freedom of information uh, rules. Um, Malaysia, we were thinking of enacting such laws, but thus far on the federal level, we do not have such freedom of information law. Um, but in state, in, in Penang and, and in Selangor, if I'm not wrong, you, we do, they do have um, such enactments where the government actually provides open data to the public. Okay, so from a contractual obligation perspective, um, when you are gathering, uh, when you're carrying out a trial, when you're carrying out a project um, with certain service providers, uh, and they are the ones who are going to supply the data to you, you've got a lot of companies out there that, that are data, data collectors, they're experts in going out to the ground, gathering data from uh, various sources. Um, you need to not only check on the law that, that, you're that they have gotten consent, but you also need to check where they're getting this database from. If these databases are actually protected by contractual obligations, then they need to ensure that they've check with say, for example, a telco um, or, a, or, or any other business was providing the data to them that they have not breached those contractual obligations, right? Because why, why am I making such a big issue out about this? The owner of the data, say for example, a telco um, finds out that you've been using its customer's data without uh, getting proper agreement from them. What they can do is of course, number one, to report to, to the authorities. Number two, they can go to court and get an injunction because you breach uh, confidentiality obligations. And that puts a halt in terms of your whole project, right? Because once you get a court order to say, stop doing certain things, then you can't proceed. And that wastes a lot of time for you to go into litigation and, and, and waste resources. Okay, I think Raj, you've covered uh, quite a bit on the different types of data and the different laws that apply. Perhaps you can go into a bit more detail on what is the main uh, law regulating personal data in Malaysia. Sure, and, and I think that's that, that's 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 very important uh, because um, behavior insights typically involves individuals, uh, you and me, uh, our family members, our friends, right? Yeah, I mean it it. it in foreign jurisdictions, behavior insights means to nudge, to nudge people to a certain way. And, and it always involves people. And that entails the use of personal data, inevitably. Um, and, to, and if you were going to use such data, you need to ensure you comply with our superstar le legislation on data protection, which is the Personal Data Protection Act. Now, it was passed in 2010. It comes under the Minister, Ministry of Communications and Multimedia. Um, it is enforced by the Personal Data Protection Commissioner. Um, it's, it's actually a very uh, interesting law. It's got seven processing principles and an infringement is actually punishable as a criminal offense with fines and imprisonment. Now, I mentioned to you that uh, earlier that a lot of behavior insights project is government related. Now the good news is the PTPA does not apply to the government. It doesn't apply to the federal and state government. I can see some people say, yay. <laughs> Why? Because the PDPA applies to a commercial transaction. When the public, when the government undertakes any behavior insight for policy considerations, that is not a commercial transaction, right? That's one. Number two, there is a total exemption when it comes to government. So the PDP doesn't apply, right? Now, what happens if you're not government, you're, 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 you're a semi-government company, then you can rely on certain other exemptions under the act, 
um, where it says that you know when it's when it's done under law, when it's when when the processing is required under a particular statute, or it is for the assessment and collection of tax, or to discharge regulatory functions. And the last one is if you look at um, the bottom uh, box, statistics and research. Now, for statistics and research, you don't need to comply. However, there's a proviso. You need to anonymize the data subject, meaning you can't say Raj went to the barber. You need to say a man above 40 years old went to the barber. Um, that, that, that is the exemption that's being granted, right? Now, Raj. I, I, yeah. So I can I just jump in on there. I mean, I don't think you would be going to the barber number one, but number two, I mean, you're showing a whole uh, lot of exemptions and non-applications. I guess the, the my question would be, does it really protect us and the law? What what what's your view on that? It does. It does. So so the the, the thinking is when government processes data, and this is what the exemptions are all uh, generally relate to. It is not for a commercial purpose, which means that the data is not sold. The data is not exploited for monetary reasons. It is it is processed by government and and. Government uses it for the general good. That, that is the thinking uh, behind the law, um, the philosophy behind the law in terms of these exemptions. So these exemptions are for a particular purpose, but the protection, the crux of the, data, the personal data protection that is still there to protect the processing of data. So uh, some clients have asked me when, you know, um, if let's say I have a family function, I snap a photo, I post it on Facebook or any other social media, do I need to comply, comply the PDPA? Or they complain to say, hey, look, somebody has taken my photo when I was walking with another person and posted it on Facebook, uh, any social media. Uh, don't they need to get my consent? They should, right? Well, there is, if you look at the uh, right box, uh, section 45 exemption, where you use it for personal, family, and household and recreational purpose, and you don't need to comply the PDPA. Again, it is not for a commercial purpose. Um, it's for a personal purpose uh, or, or recreational purpose. Then, then you don't need to. Okay. Why am I uh, emphasizing so much on the PDPA? <laughs> but if you don't comply, you can go to jail. <laughs> and importantly, now, uh, not the, the, the Personal Data Protection Act um, has got what we call a corporate liability provision, which means that if the company uh, commits, does not comply with the PDPA, um, it, 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 it has liability on a director, uh, senior management, C-suite uh, members, and also any person that's in charge of, say, the particular project or compliance with data protection. They can be jointly charged with the company. So together with the company, they will be fine. And of course, the company can't go to jail, right? It's an artificial person. Guess who goes to jail? <laughs> so it is therefore very important to ensure that you comply with the PDP. And, and the most important thing is, Ignorance is not a defense. You cannot come and say, I thought I did not need to comply because I was just doing a general research for on a, on a policy project. You know, it was for a good intention. Why, why do I need to comply? Well, ignorance is not a defense. So I just explained to you um, that there is a corporate liability provision. So make sure that you comply. These are the individuals that can be charged together with the company. Of course, there is defenses. And of course, this is the time where you should hire people uh, to lawyers to help you with this. But generally the defense is basically this, that you had, you, you, the, the offense was committed without your knowledge. It was, it was done without, inform the board, nobody informed the board about it, somebody just went and did it on their own volition. That is the defense. Plus the board must also prove that they have taken measures, they have done due diligence to prevent the commission of the offense. How do you show this? A compliance program. So if you are into data, if your business of the company is into data collection and data processing, you need to have a compliance program in place to ensure there is no misuse of data. There is, you ensure that you comply with the PDPA, um, for example, to get consent, to provide the privacy notice, to make sure that the data is properly secured. And also when you disclose data to third parties, you have proper consent. So these things need to be in place in order for you to rely on the Raj, um, looking at that list, I don't see the lawyers there. So are the lawyers not uh, liable in this situation? Well, if, if the lawyers gives you wrong advice, then uh, of course you sue the lawyers, but no, the lawyers won't go to jail. <laughs>
Okay, talking personal data, personal data, personal question. I, I can hear some of the uh, participants asking, what is personal data? Okay, personal data is, is simply put, uh, non-legal term, any data that can identify an individual, typically a name, an address of the person, the NRIC number, a person's telephone number, uh, email address, photograph, image. Um, and I think going towards much more um, advanced technology, DNA profiling, these things can be personal data. What some data uh, can relate to an individual. Um, there's, there is certain data where you need one set of data and another set of data to, in, to, to, to identify an individual. This combined is personal data, right? So if you see address, if I tell you that um, uh, Izaha lives in, in, in say, uh, um, Monkera, for example, I give you the address, right? The address alone cannot identify Izaha. But if I combine one information with another, that would identify Izaha, who stays in this area. That together is personal data. If I talk about, if what my bosses now uh, say that Raj, a partner in Zaid Ibrahim and Co, and um, not performing or being very lazy. The comment about Raj on its own without identifying me is not personal data. But if, it, if it's joined together in during an appraisal to say Raj is lazy and he's not performing, that together is personal data. Okay? Which is not true and could be defamatory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on, Raj. Okay, so what are the salient elements of the PDPA? These are the four keywords that you need to, to, to remember. If you don't remember anything about uh, the PDPA, these are the four things that you should uh, take away. Number one is personal data. I explained to you, um, it is any information that can identify a person. Secondly is processing. What, what is processing? Processing is anything that you do on the data, collecting, storing, recording, um, uh, use, the, using analytics on the on the data. These are all processing. Now, I mentioned to you storing because I have a lot of clients who come and tell me, Raj, I'm not processing because I take the data, I only keep it in, in, I keep it in the file or I keep it in the storage. I don't use it at all. It's just there. Now, if you do, that is still processing. Why? Because the definition of processing includes holding and storing. Even if you don't use it, even if it's archived, even if it's um, encrypted and nobody uses it, it is still processing. So if you do, it, you must comply with the PDP. Okay. Now, who are the people that need to comply with the PDP? These are the category of people is, is data users. A data user is a person who processes data for his purpose. This is as opposed to a data processor. A data processor is a person who processes the data for the data user. Now, the PDP compliance obligations is on the data user and not the data processor. I know this sounds very legalistic. Let me give you an example. Say, for example, you're a company that engages the IT service provider to do your HR management systems uh, or, or to do uh, analytics in terms of your employee behavioral uh, pattern. You want to nudge your employee in a certain way, you get these consultants to come in and to do a study, you feed the consultants with data so that they can come up with the analytics, right? To say, for example, increase productivity, right? Okay. The consultant processes the data not for itself. It processes for the company. In that scenario, the company is a data user, definitely, because it is processing the data for its purpose. The, the consultant is not doing it for its own purpose. It is doing it under the instructions of the company it now cannot use that data and go and sell it to say a competitor of the company, or it cannot go and uh, publish a report to the public and get money from it. Because why? Again, he is strictly following the instructions of the data user. So in that scenario, the compliance obligations are all on the company, the data user, and the data processor must follow whatever the data user says, okay? Now, the other bucket here is commercial transaction. If the processing does not involve a commercial transaction, the PDPA doesn't apply. So governmental purposes, um, you know, if it, if it involves uh, social welfare, if it involves uh, any other non-commercial reason, then the PDPA doesn't apply. If the PDPA applies to you, as, as I mentioned the trigger points earlier, you need to comply with these seven principles. I know 
it is a mouthful. <laughs> the general principal notice and choice security. So, so all this is very complicated. If um, you, you, you you don't if, if you don't go down to a bit more granularity, but once you understand it, it's actually quite straightforward. The general principle basically means that um, when you when you process data, you need to get consent. Uh, if you don't want to get consent, you need to check whether any of the exceptions apply. Say for example, in a in a contractual arrangement, you don't need to have separate consent because you already have a contractual relationship. In that scenario, you don't need to get consent. Okay, that, so that's the general principle. Notice and choice is actually quite simple because now whenever you go into any place, you visit any building, you sign up for any online platforms, when you buy something from an e-commerce platform, you will be always asked to tick the privacy notice. Why are they doing this? It is because of the notice and choice principle. Under the notice and choice principle, the company or the data user must inform you on what it's doing with your data. The purpose of the processing, who it discloses to, uh, how, how do I contact the, the, the company to change my, my preference and those sort of things, it is stated in the privacy notice. So why is companies all doing this now? Because of the notice of choice, okay? The, uh, lastly is the security principle. Now the security principle basically means that you need to employ certain measures to protect the data. What are the measures? The PDP doesn't say. Why? Because there's no one size fits all security uh, measure. The more data that you have, the more intensive data that you have, the higher the wall that you need to build. If you, don't, if you only have the person's name and contact number, email address, then the, look, the, the wall can be lower, right? But if you, if you know that um, this person's preference is KFC on every weekend, or this person has a medical condition that he seeks treatment every month, that is very, very intense data, and that's very serious data. Then your wall to protect the data must be much more higher. Okay. I won't go into all the other principles, just these three. Mm -hmm. um, so I explained to you earlier that uh, for general principle, you, you need to get consent and you need to process it for a lawful purpose. Um, because this frog here is very stubborn, he doesn't want to give consent. Notice and choice. So these are these are the few buckets in your privacy notice. All these bucket of items must be must be stated. So you, that's why you see a lot of the privacy notice is very thick and long. Why? Because these mandatory matters must be stated in the privacy notice. But don't forget, and a lot of times make this mistake. You can have a brilliantly drafted English privacy notice. Don't forget that you must have both English and Bahasa Malaysia. It's not one or the other. It's both. Okay, so thank you Raj for that insightful sharing on how data is uh, as a commodity is regulated and that if someone wants to use uh, that data to influence our behavior, there are already laws in place to protect us. Uh, I think a lot of companies out there now will think twice before they want to use our data for the purposes of behavioral insights and I appreciate you highlighting this very uh, important issue on the, how there are laws in place. But I think importantly, as you have already pointed out, uh, the crux of our law is to protect someone but only to the extent that someone consents. So as I said earlier, if we, for example, fix a box without reading certain terms and conditions and consent to the use of our data, then ignorance of the law is not a anymore. So be mindful, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you do take a box without reading these terms and conditions, you don't know what your data may be used for. Uh, I thank you again, uh, Raj, for sharing, and let's move on to the question and answer session. Okay. We have a question here, which is about your personal views on behavioral insights. So do you think uh, in the absence of a legal restriction to use um, behavioral insights to you know, influence behavior, do you see that there's any issue to using uh, or applying behavioral insights, I guess from a, from a moral perspective, or do you think that this is something that's good because it actually you know, assists people in actually um, uh, choosing better solutions, which one? Which one are you uh, more in favor of? I, I would. 
Actually, I would go for the latter, definitely. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits when it comes to behavioral insights. I mean, take, for example, assessing the impact of a policy consideration. Now, with behavioral insights, with the data that you've gathered, with the research, uh, you can stress test policies to, to, to assess whether the impact has been effective or whether there needs to be changes to the policies. Now, without behavioral insights, um, I mean, you big government authorities, uh, public authorities, or even businesses would be um, carrying on certain policies which have not been effective. And, and that entails costs. Uh, well, in the, in, in, in the perspective of the public authority, it entails taxpayers' money. In the, in the context of businesses, the businesses' profits are being wasted because why? Um, there's not enough stress tests on policies, decision-making, uh, mm -hmm. and also um, any other factors that has been implemented. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I believe that um, behavioral insights is, is really very useful. Um, and and um, yeah, that actually that's my answer. It's very useful. <laughs> All right, thanks, right. So I guess the summary to that is that the benefits you know, outweigh the, the costs in terms of adopting or utilizing behavioral insights. We have a question here, which is, uh, what do you think uh, the regulators can do in terms of improving behavior insights regulations in Malaysia. I, I, I well, I think the regulators should look at um, look at coming up with with more guidelines which facilitate and provide more clarity in terms of the compliance obligations in in collecting um, data, using the data, and also exploiting the data uh, for example for behavioral insights. Now, um, when, when we say regulations or guidelines, we, we, we don't just mean prohibitive uh, regulations to say that, look, you cannot do this or you cannot do that. Uh, if you do so, you can be fined or imprisonment. I mean, that, that's, that is deterrent kind of, of legislation, but the legislation or the, the regulatory framework that we're looking at uh, that would be very helpful for research, analytics, uh, would be those which are facilitated if you want to take the data to do certain projects or certain research, these are the compliance obligations that you need to do. And once you do this, there's a, a kind of a, like a safe harbor that, that you will not breach the law. So, so these kind of facilitative uh, regulatory regimes provide a lot of certainty to business. And businesses, any kind of projects, what you need is regulatory certainty. That is the most important. And when you have that certainty, there would, in, there would definitely promote and, and make behavioral insights much more popular, much more effective, because you have more people investing into this, this kind of research or willing to invest into this because they know that they will not be uh, in breach and the cost of compliance becomes much lower because there's certainty. You, you don't want the cost of compliance to be so prohibitive that people just, businesses or even the government, public sector say, look, it's just not worth it because we have to go through so many hurdles to comply before we can undertake this kind of and when there is certainty, um, then, then that, that, is, that, that promotes uh, this kind of project. Raj, what is your last uh, takeaway or message you would like to give to the audience in terms of behavioral insights and the law? Okay, there's, uh, <laughs> there's one takeaway from my boring session. <laughs> is, is this um, planning. I think planning becomes very important uh, when, when, when uh, any businesses or even the government or public authorities are undertaking any projects relating to river insights, uh, research or analytics. Um, proper planning means compliance, proper planning means uh, reduction in cost, but proper planning also means uh, efficiency, right? So that you do not prolong the project unnecessarily because it, it was not planned properly. Uh, from, from the legal side, uh, planning means ensuring that, that you know what is the type of data that you need, what is the in, how the data is input into the research platform. Say, for example, if you don't really need uh, data that can identify an individual, you anonymize it properly, you, then the, PD, the personal data protection act will not even apply. If you're going to take financial services data, say, for example, payment patterns or payment uh, preferences, then again, anonymization may be very useful because then you may not even need to get consent. So planning becomes very important. Uh, when it comes to undertaking these projects. So that is one big takeaway that I would like to add. 
Thank you again, Raj, for that insightful sharing session and answering all those questions. Uh, thank you, MPC, for this opportunity. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, joining into this session today. Uh, if you have any further questions that you would like to ask Raj, he has promised that he would reply to all of you if you email him at the email address that we are sharing on the screen now. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this session as much as I have. And uh, till next time, stay safe. Goodbye.